So today I want to talk to you about mean and standard deviations. Um, gotta love some XKCD, so if you want to pause it and read the cartoon, feel free. But before we talk about that, I need to talk to you about random and systematic uncertainties. So when you make an experimental measurement, you have to repeat it multiple times, and this helps you to reduce the experimental uncertainty in the final value that you report. The reason that that helps is because there's always noise or random error in measurements. And random errors are unpredictable and they're just as likely to land above as below the true value. You can minimize random error, but you can't eliminate it entirely. So here's a picture of what random error looks like on a scatter plot or on a data plot and you can see that you could probably draw a line through that data and you would see your value, your mean, but it's very noisy and it can go up and down around that value. That's random error. One thing to think about is that you can, you can reduce it, but you can't get rid of it. In the case of that, let's say that you're trying to make an electrical measurement and you have these wires that aren't well shielded, okay, so you could get a lot of electrical noise for that. Well, you could help by replacing it with better wires, with better shielding, or perhaps wrapping foil around the wires, but you're still not going to eliminate all electrical noise from your experiment, no matter how hard you try. Systematic errors, on the other hand, occur when your measurements are consistently abo above or consistently below the true value. And for example, here in these plots, I show some, some data plotted. The red line is indicated by the true value, and the blue dashed line is indicated by the average for that data set, which should be the best value for the data set. And you can see in the upper left corner that there's a significant discrepancy between the red and the blue lines, indicating that a lot of your values lie below your true value. And most of these values lie below the true value line. You only see a couple that are above. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you look at the plot in the lower left, um, the red and the blue line are much closer together, and you can see that a lot of the data points lie both above and below that red line, indicating that there's not as much systematic error in the system. You can also see that there's differences in the random error for some of these things. There's more of a spread, for example, in the ones at top than there are in the ones at the bottom. Now, you want to do your best. In an ideal world, you would make both your random and your systematic error as small as possible. Systematic error can arise also from improperly calibrated devices or failing to account for experimental var variables. For example, um, you could account for and correct for systematic error by making sure that the scale that you're using to measure the mass has been calibrated with known masses and that you've calibrated all along the range that you're working in. Or, for example, if you're using a thermometer to measure temperatures, you could calibrate by using the freezing and boiling points which are known for some substance that's in the range that you're working in, and that calibrates your instrument. Another thing is, for example, if you forget to take something into account, like air resistance, in an experiment that you're doing on projectile motion, sometimes air resistance can be a significant contributor, and it could make your measurements consistently wrong off by a certain amount. Here I show these, uh, these, th these bullseyes, and you can see that the one here in the first has a small uh, random error and a large systematic error. And then the second one shows scattered all around the bullseye, and that has a large random error and a small systematic error. But see, the problem with um, real data taking is that you don't know what the answer is. So there might be a bullseye, but you don't know whether you've hit it or not. So that's always the problem with real data. Okay, so. What you can do, though, what you can control is to reduce your systematic error as much as possible, so you do your best in that regard, and you do your best to reduce the random error. And then another way that you can help is by taking that mean or average. So taking many measurements and finding the mean or average is another way to reduce uncertainty on your best value for your measured value. And this is because if the uncertainty is random, your data points are just as likely to be above as below your true value. And so by taking an average, they kind of cancel each other out. Hopefully at this point you guys all know how to take an average, but there's the formula just in case. You sum up all your data and then you divide by the total number of data points. And we often use this bar notation to indicate an average. So X with a bar on top indicates X average. 
Now, the uncertainty on a single data point within a data set is the standard deviation. So you might have n data points, xi, right? And the standard deviation would be uncertainty on one of those data points, xi. To find the um, standard deviation, what we have to do first is find what we call the residual. So in order to find a standard deviation, you first calculate your average, and then you find the residual for each data point by taking the value for the data point and subtracting off the average. And that gives you your residual, which I've indicated here and called d sub i. Then to find the sample standard deviation, you do the square root of the sum of the squares of your residuals divided by the total number of data points n minus 1, as indicated here in the formula. Now this is the sample standard deviation. The sample standard deviation accounts for the um, fact that if you only have one data point, your uncertainty should go to infinity, right, because you're then dividing by zero. The population standard deviation is also something that gets used a lot in this book, okay? That 1 over n minus 1 factor in the sample standard deviation is the definition that you should use for smaller data sets. In fact, most of the data sets that you've used in this class, you're safer using the 1 over n minus 1. Um, and it, like I said, it corrects for the stupid. <laughs> if n is large, though, uh, then the 1 over n minus 1 versus the 1 over n, they go to the same value, and the values for the sample standard deviation and the population standard deviation would be really close, in which case it doesn't matter too much. So I'm going to say just go ahead and use the sample standard deviation, but what we'll do is for the population standard deviation, that might show up later in some proofs and things in later chapters, and so I want you to be familiar with it too. Now, if you use the standard deviation as your uncertainty on a value, xi, then what you can say is that you're 68% confident that the true value, your best value, your, your average, lies within the range of that uncertainty. This will hold as long as your uncertainties are due to noise and not systematic error. Now we're going to talk more about confidence levels and 68% later when we get to the Gaussian or normal distribution function. But for now, just understand that the standard deviation is the uncertainty on a single data point, not your best value, your single data point, and that what it means is that if you use that as your uncertainty, then you're 68% confident that the true value lies within that range, xi minus the standard deviation to xi plus the standard deviation. Now, the standard deviation is the uncertainty of a single measurement x sub i. But most of the time, what we want to do when we're getting a best value is to find the uncertainty on the average, okay? So if you find your average of n measurements, that gives you your value x bar, your average, and you want the uncertainty on the average, then it's given by what we call the standard deviation of the mean. This is also sometimes called the standard error of the mean. That is given by sigma sub x bar, which is equal to your standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of data points in. Now, this actually is a lower uncertainty for the average than it is on a single data point, which makes sense. Your average should be a better value. If you want to increase your uncertainty on that average by increasing the number of data points, you can do it. You just have to take more data. But think about it. If you want to reduce your uncertainty by a factor of 10, then that means that you have to take 100 data points. And sometimes, for some experiments, that can be pretty time consuming. Okay. I'd like to do a proof now, just to emphasize the point that the standard deviation of the mean is the uncertainty on the average, and the standard deviation is the uncertainty on the single data point. Okay. To calculate an average, what you do is you sum up all your x values and divide by n. Let's assume that the standard deviation sigma sub x is the uncertainty on one data point, one of those. We're going to follow the rules for propagation of uncertainty. Remember that when you're adding, okay, when you're adding, you do the square root of the sum of the squares of the absolute uncertainty. In this case, the absolute uncertainty on each data point is your standard deviation sigma sub x. Okay? If you sum all of those up and the uncertainty on each data point is the same, in other words, it's the standard deviation for each one, then you get the square root of the number of data points that you have n times the square of your standard deviation. 
Now, in order to propagate the uncertainty through, what you're going to do is you're going to then divide by the number of data points, okay? Because what you're doing is you're adding all your data points up and then you're dividing by a known constant. And that known constant is the number of data points that you have. So first, you do the square root of the sum of the squares, your absolute uncertainties, and then you divide by that known constant, which is the number of data points, or n. So you get the square root of n sigma x squared divided by n, which gives you sigma x over the square root of n, and that is the standard deviation of the mean. Okay? So hopefully it's just a, a quick little proof to prove to you standard deviation of the mean, uncertainty on your average. Now, what about systematic uncertainties? Well, taking a mean and a standard deviation doesn't help with that, not at all. So the best thing that you could do is to get rid of your systematic uncertainties. However, if you realize that for whatever reason you've done a 4210 experiment and you've run out of time and you know you've got this systematic uncertainty, okay, something like that, one of those scenarios, if you have that going on, then you can report your un total uncertainty by combining the random uncertainty and the systematic uncertainty in quadrature, okay, as I showed below here in that formula. Now, right now, I'd like to do an example. It's problem 4.6 in your textbook, number 6, chapter 4. A nuclear physicist uses a Geiger counter to monitor the number of cosmic ray particles in his lab in any two-second interval. He counts this 20 times with the following results, and those results are displayed there. I'm not going to read them out. So find the mean and the standard deviation of these numbers, and the latter should be approximately equal to the square root of the former. How well is this expectation borne out? Okay, so you might be thinking, okay, I know how to do num or part A, but what the heck is up with part B? So let me explain about counting experiments. Counting experiments. Radioactivity is a counting experiment. It's not something that we're going to deal with too much in 2210 or 4210, maybe a little bit, but it is useful in physics in general, especially when you're dealing with something like radioactivity. So what you do in a counting experiment or a radioactivity experiment is you count the number of decays in some given time interval, okay? So let's say that um, you're counting the number of decays that happen in two seconds. Well, as the sample age ages, what will happen is it will become less radioactive, which means that fewer radioactive particles will be given off in each two-second time interval that you're looking at. And, it, and act, actually, it'll fall off exponentially as your sample ages. Um, other kinds of counting experiments that they dwell on in the book are things like the number of babies born in a two-week period or the number of cars arriving at a stoplight during each light cycle. Your textbook also is really obsessed with the number of eggs that chickens lay during a certain period of time. So these are all things that are counting experiments. You're counting something. Now, for counting experiments, the best idea is to take a lot of data and then to take the average. And then your reported uncertainty is just the square root of your average, okay? So for counting experiments, you count all your counts up, and then the uncertainty will be the square root of the number of counts. So what this problem is doing, number 4-6 in your text, it's just demonstrating that this is true for a counting experiment, that the standard deviation gives you the same as the square root on your average, okay? So, the solution is origin, okay? So what I'm going to do at this time is I'm going to take you through how to do this kind of problem in origin. Origin is a, pro a program that you're going to use a lot, I think, in uh, 2210 and 4210 for data analysis. So I have the example pulled up here. It's super easy in origin to find um, statistics on a data set. It'll do it all for you and it automates it, okay? So what I've done is I've gone ahead and entered line by line the number of counts from that problem, okay? And then I just asked it to generate those statistics for me. So let me just show you how I did that. I'm not going to enter all these because that would be time consuming, but I will do a quick sample. So all you do to enter data is you click on the cell and then you type the number in the cell and then you hit enter. So I'm just going to go one, two, two, three, four, five. Okay, so I entered the data. Now I'm going to highlight that data, okay? And then I go up and I click on the statistics tab and I click on descriptive statistics and statistics on columns, and then I tell it to open a dialog box, okay? And it does that for me.
When the dialog box pops up, it asks me which ones, which statistics I'm interested in. Okay, so you can make the check mark for any st stat that you want to see. So I checked uh, the total number of data points, the mean, the standard deviation, and I'm going to go ahead and check SE of the mean, which means standard error of the mean, which is what your um, this software program calls the standard deviation of the mean. Okay, now I'm going to click OK. Once I click OK, I'm going to say um, it's going to generate a report sheet for me and then I'll click on that tab at the bottom to open up that report sheet and there's my information. That's everything that I need to know about my data. Okay? The total number is in, there's five data points, the mean is three, the standard deviation is 1.6 and the standard deviation of the mean is 0.7. Okay? So that's all the data. Alright, so that's how to do it. Let's go back to our problem though. So if you're on sheet one, it was column A here, okay, and I have all these counts entered. So now I'm going to open up the dialog box that was generated for the stats on the counts. There were 20 total data points. The mean of those data points was 10.7. The standard deviation was 3.4, and the standard deviation of the mean was about 0.76, okay? So that's how you do it. That's how you get it in origin, and now I'm going to open back up here. So for the problem, it asks, uh, what was the mean and the standard deviation? Well, we would report 10.7 as our best value, plus or minus 3.4 for our standard deviation. That was our standard deviation. Now, if you compare the counting experiment value, what you would do to find the uncertainty in a counting experiment is to take the square root of the mean number of counts. So the mean number of counts was 10.7. If we take the square root of that number, you'll find that it's 3.3. Now compare that to the standard deviation, and the standard deviation is 3.4. So that matches very closely, and so you can see that there's good agreement, which is kind of a justification for using a square root as your value for a counting experiment. Okay, so that's what I want to tell you about the chapter on mean, standard deviation, and counting experiments, and um, see you in class.